Before I start, I just want to do a test and see if I need a microphone or can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight on behalf of the Friends of Fondren and welcome you to the Books That Shape My World event tonight. I'm Natalie Appel. Um, I'm a board member with the Friends of Fondren Library that supports these programs. Uh, and for a few of you that I don't know in the room, I'm one of those Rice Lifers, student, parent, faculty, magister, and now I get to do really fun stuff like this. So I'm really thrilled to be here tonight to uh, welcome all of our members and guests, and I'm very proud to welcome uh, Dr. Yusuf Shamu who has been the Ralph and Dorothy Looney Professor of Biosciences at Rice and uh, has joined the faculty in 1998, right when um, my second owl daughter was born, so I will always remember that date. Dr. Shamu has served many roles on the campus, and it's going to be very challenging to summarize everything he's done, but I don't want to give a lecture myself, so I'm going to just summarize a few highlights. Um, Dr. Shamu served as Vice Provost of Research since 2014. Um, the university's research grants during that time increased by 42 percent uh, according to the provost and one highlight of that time has been the focus on engagement with industry through research and technology transfer i'd love to hear more about that and uh, prior to that he was the director of the institute of biosciences and bioengineering from 2008 to 2014 Dr. Shamu has received numerous teaching awards, including the top teaching award at Rice, the George R. Brown Award for Excellence in Teaching, as well as the American Society of Microbiology Distinguished Lecture Award from 2011 to 2013. His research is supported by the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Defense um, working in the Shamu Laboratory, his research team focuses on the rise of multi-drug resistant bacteria. What I think is fascinating is that as Vice Provost, his emphasis was on spreading the research grants across all academic areas, humanities, social sciences, um, STEM, biomedical, all of it, and regarding books and his love of books he says throughout the course of my life books have been my most constant companion I read every day and across a wide range of topics so with that please welcome Dr. Shum. Thank, thank you very much and um, can everybody hear me okay I'm, I'm used to yelling at undergraduates so this shouldn't be anything new uh, so thank you for the introduction. I promise I will not talk about scientific papers or technical reports. That's my day life. But what we're going to talk about today is a much more interesting question. And I was, I was speaking to Mary and I said, you know, when I heard this question, like, what are the books that shaped your life? And you're a voracious reader. It took me months to think about this question. I, I thought about it every other day, basically. Saying, what are the books? Because I don't, you should go home and think about it. What are the books that actually changed you in some way? And if you read a lot, you get to this other problem of, well, I've got a lot of books I want to talk about in a very short period of time. So you have to figure out you know, what you're going to sort of cut it down to and what narrative you can impose on it. Because I bet you none of you, unless you've done this, have actually thought about what is the narrative of the books I have read. You've always just thought, I read books I liked. But you never probably have thought about why do I like them or what have they done to me. I had not thought of that. And so in that sense, this has been a fantastic experience for me to just do this. Just that was interesting. Now, whether you'll find the books I find interesting, interesting, that's a different question. So I'm not going to spend a few minutes on each, on a few books. 
but I'm, I'm not going to give any spoilers. I thought to myself, well, I could, if I go into some sort of in-depth analysis of a book, I'm inevitably going to tell you something about the book, and then you won't read it, or you'll be mad at me, right? <laughs> so we're going to go through like how the book's interacted with me and my own uh, life, but I hope you'll like the selection. It's a pretty wide variety of things, um, but we'll see. We'll see how this goes. This, uh, I won't have to give this talk again, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, I have always been interested in history, for instance. In his, and great, great leaders, leadership in all of its forms. As, as a young man, I looked at these people that were historically huge figures, politically, militarily, uh, in any dimension, and I, I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to understand what made them successful. How could Alexander the Great have conquered the world at that age, right? How could this, how could this have happened? And, and you could be wondering, and I think it's a fair question, well, Yusuf, how do you know that was your first love, that, those his, that history was your first love. And I have some, I went and found some evidence, I think. So that's me, right? I was cute and I had hair. Um, and that's my cat, right? So I got this cat when I was in first grade in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, great cat, by the way. Um, and I know how much I liked history because his name was Napoleon. <laughs> first grade. First grade. So, strange child grows up to be professor or academic, you're not surprised, right? So, the other thing is clearly, I read a lot of history to sort of help me understand the world, but then I actually got really interested in hearing, uh, reading autobiographies, in their, people in their own words. It's, a, you know, it's nice when you're starting out to have a historian tell you, tells you what a, an event means, but I got very interested in, in sort of hearing from the person, first person perspective. What did they think about what they were doing? Why were they doing it? At least what they thought they were doing. And so I got very interested in this, what I call these conversations with ghosts, right? So you think about it, a book is the only thing we're ever gonna have in our lives is anything like a time machine. You can go back and you can read the words of somebody who was you know, a thousand years ago. And you can, in your mind, have that conversation. Now they can't reply, they can't reply but that doesn't mean you can't have the conversation. You're sort of having it with yourself and you're, and you're simulacrum of them in your mind. And you can have that in a way that is, I think, transformative when you think about it. It's very unique to books, right? It's something that they give you that is, I think, the ability to talk into the past and learn from the somebody else, the bad things, the good things, is, I think, really powerful. And one of the reasons I am so drawn to books in general. And so I read these books with all these questions in mind. Now, as a young man, I didn't have those fully developed, obviously, but as I got older, it was clear, and as I thought about this talk, why I was interested in these books. I wanted to learn from these people. And I'll give you um, a couple examples of books that I think reflect on the things you can learn from, from these sorts of historical ramblings, basically. And so, the kind of books that I read in this, you know, I've read throughout the course of my life, not, they're not the most common book I read. I read a lot of science fiction. We'll talk about that as well. But these autobiographies, I picked out a sampling here, represent some of the books that I, I learned a lot from. And so I think I was interested in understanding how did, these, how did these great leaders come about? How did they learn from their mistakes? How did they learn to be successful? What made them successful, right, besides what people told me about them? Let me, they would tell me in their own words. So with, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Julius Caesar and Winston Churchill. Ulysses S. Grant is a fascinating character, often maligned in history. He wasn't a terrible general. He was actually a good general. And he was actually not a bad president. He had very bad taste in friends, though. <laughs> and he did drink too much. That seems to be true. But, but let me tell you about Julius Caesar. Chronicle, uh, you know, he, he, his writings around uh, his conquest of Gaul are really interesting. Now, I wanted to, yeah, he is, I think, known to all of us in some way or another, right? Julius Caesar is one of these people that is actually well-preserved through time. And I wanted to talk about one, one battle he's famous for, it's the Battle of Elysium, right? And so it exhibits all of his characteristics in one moment. So proconsul, young man, Julius Caesar, has an army, a modestly sized army, and he's in the south of what is now modern-day France. He decides to invade Gaul. I don't think he really had much of a permission to take, march his armies north. He actually, he had political ambitions, and you had to make a name for yourself if you were gonna be big in Rome, right? So he invades Gaul, now, now France, and he, he finds himself up against an army of a, a fairly similar size, led by a Gaulish 
a leader by, by the name of Vercingetorix. And they fight, they fight. Vercingetorix retreats into Gaul, up north, into this, more towards this, uh, away from Caesar and away from Rome. And he finds himself, uh, Vercingetorix decides he's going to hold up in this city, Elysia, which, we'll give a little pointer here, and this little artist rendered, is a city that sits up on a hill and it's fortified, so it has a, it has a, a wall around it. So it's a great city to say, I'm going to, okay, fine, I'm going to, I'm going to sit in this and you're going to have to siege me out of here, right? And so Vercingetorix takes his Gaulish army, which is about the same size as Caesar, goes up into the mountains, and up into this hill, and, and goes into the city. Caesar logically comes up to him, and up to the city, and then sieges the city, encircles the city. The Roman engineers build a wall around the city, because the Romans are big on engineering, right? So they're going to say, nobody's going to get out of the city, we're, going to, we're just going to siege you and we're going, to, we're going to starve you out. Classic, right? Okay, but Vercingetorix knows something very important. He's got food, he's got water, he's got some time. What he really is interested in is the fact that there's a, a Gaulish army of tribes four times the size of Caesar's army coming to rescue him. So he knows he's just got to sit tight. When the army arrives, he'll drive out of the town, they'll drive in, and they'll crush Caesar like a grape. Right? Rock and hard place. Classic, right? Now Caesar finds out about, because things moved very slowly back then, you know, no satellites, no cell phones, right? So he finds out that the Gaul, this group, this big army is coming his way. Okay. So, okay, so you, here's the city. I'm here. I'm sieging the city. And there's a huge army coming up behind me. What do I do? What does any sane person do? I think they move, they break the siege properly and they move back to sort of fight as an army five times their size, or at least just to keep walking away from an army five times its size, right? That's common wisdom. It makes perfect sense. It's the logical thing to do. But what he does instead is his engineers built a second wall around his army. So now his army is in this little donut, surrounded on both sides by the Gauls. Like, who, who does that, right? It's, it's incredibly, you could say, stupid idea, except his army is now trapped here. There is no escape for them, clearly. They do have to fight now. There is no escape. You have to fight. There's no way getting out of this. And he beats Vercingetorix and all the Gaulish forces in this battle. It just shows you his aggressiveness and his certainty and in in his confidence in his, in his officers. In this case, uh, this, these were his lieutenants, all very capable. You recognize Mark Antony there uh, and Brutus. All of these but Mark Antony end up being against him when he tries to overthrow the Roman Republic and unfortunately successfully does so. Mark Antony was a, was a great cavalryman for Julius Caesar. He was great on horses. Which always reminds me of this line from, from Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. When Cleopatra thinks back fondly to Mark Antony, saying, Oh, happy horse, to bear the weight of Antony. And I was like, when I first read that line in high school, I'm like, whoa, that's pretty racy. <laughs> I didn't know Shakespeare was that racy. And it turns out he is. So, this also is my reminder, I do this a lot, to remind me to talk about the fact that when you read history of the last, of, you know, up until very recently, there is a voice missing. The voice of half of our population. The losers. Well, there's the losers. There's another voice. Women. You don't, women did not write histories. They were not, in, they were not, their, their stories did not survive. And when they did survive, they were often um, through this very, um, I would say, not flattering lens of the patriarchy of that time. So, for instance, Cleopatra, uh, Catherine the Great, kind of cast as sexual vixens, right? Cleopatra was a very capable leader of her people. Alternatively, the other choice you had, instead of being considered, you know, this vixen, is you could be sort of this virginal person like Joan of Arc. But their stories are not told in their voice. And that's, we'll come back to that later, but when you read these older books, you sort of begin to wonder, where was half the population? And as a biologist, I can tell you that there was half the population, it was definitely women back then. So this is my reminder to come back to this later. So, Julius, I mean, uh, Winston Churchill, I think we all know, right, at some level, right? He, has an, he is an amazing orator. He is an amazing writer as well. He won the, he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1953. He is a, and I think he's a controversial figure depending on what part of the world you're from, 
right? If you're, from, if you're from India, for instance, you may not have the same great opinion of Winston Churchill as maybe I do as, a, as American, right? And, but he has all these amazing books. I could, I could put 20 slide decks of great quotes from Winston Churchill, and they'd all be great, right? Uh, my favorite is this one right here. If you're going through hell, keep going. Right? I always liked that one. But he was a brilliant writer and orator, and he was the right person at the right time to save the British, right? To give them hope, to give them, and we see this now, how, how much leadership matters to a people in conflict. To have, the conf have somebody has confidence in their strength and in their durability is an important thing in a leader in a war, right? And Winston Churchill embodied all of, all of those things. In his book, and this is, I think, the best book of his, I, I feel is his best book, The Second World War, is almost 5,000 pages long, and is, and is quite a read. But it's very well written, and among the things you get out of this book is the really intimate relationship he has with FDR. So that relationship between Churchill and, and, and Roosevelt is critical to the outcome of World War II. And the confidence that, that Churchill had that Roosevelt was going to get the United States into this fight, one way or the other, becomes really clear when you read the book. That he was depending on it, quite honestly. And what you also see when you read these personal narratives, you get to know about the feelings they have for people, like personally, like this person was a jerk, or this person, you know, Churchill didn't use words like that, but close, even more eloquent. Um, he had a very low opinion of Stalin, for instance. And, uh, and when you read, the, you read any of Churchill's writings, it becomes very clear what he thinks about Stalin. And I would say he, you know, he hates Hitler more, but it's not by a lot. He really despised Stalin. Necessary evil was, I think, the best way to put it in his mind. And so when you read these accounts, you get the sense of the personalities, the, you know, like the relationships of the leaders to each other, whether they're generals or, or other foreign dignitaries. So great, great author, great, great writer. And uh, although in his books, like in many autobiographies, you know, we all know Churchill made many mistakes. He did. He made many bad decisions. But in these books, they don't sound like they were bad decisions. They just sound like other people screwed up, right? <laughs> which is common in autobiographies, right? I didn't make any mistakes. It was those other people. OK, so we're going we're gonna to turn sort of dramatically now. Because I got, after reading about these great men sort of my whole life, I began to get interested in what I would call uh, the granularity of the human experience the one-person experience of adversity and challenge. I, very, I wanted to understand the nature of struggle. I wanted to understand the terrible things that can happen to people and why in some moments they succeed and make the right decisions and do all the right things, but in others, do not. I was very interested in that understanding the human spirit. And one of the ways in which I wanted to understand that was by reading personal accounts of tragedy. And so as a boy, one of the, my most seminal memories from television, which I think was very eye-opening for me, was, uh, I was I'm old enough to remember the Vietnam War quite clearly, and I remember the My Lai Massacre. So the, for those of you who are not old enough to remember this terrible event, uh, a group of American, a, a large number of American soldiers in, in, in an angry rage go into a Vietnamese hamlet, small village, and essentially begin murdering everybody, women and children included, and worse. This was, as for a boy, was unbelievable. These are the good guys. America, we're the good guys. This cannot happen. This sort of thing cannot happen. And it confused me because it, it broke with my reality, right? That I, we are the good guys. We don't do those things. And it stayed with me through time. And I, I looked into this event a little bit more. And it, there's, as awful as it was, as awful as it was, there was one shining moment of human character. Flying over the village is an American helicopter. The pilot sees what's going on below him and makes that decision. He lands the helicopter and he stops the massacre. And he does it through force of will. Because when he got there, they're like, you, go, you got no business here, just fly on. He tells his gunners who are on the helicopter, if they don't stop, we're going to shoot them. We're going to actually fire Ameri on American troops. How does he make that decision? The easiest thing to do is just to keep flying. You don't, I don't know what's going on down there, I'm not going to look. But that person makes that decision. That crystalline moment, he makes the right decision, the amazing decision of strength. And nobody knows his name like that. Hugh Thompson. 
He was awarded a medal after the war, lived a pretty anonymous life after that. And he didn't really care. He just had made the right decision. Well, what else would you do? And if you look at these, you know, also formative for me in my youth was uh, Stanley Milgram's experiments, Obedience to Authority, right? Where you sort of see the, the fact that everybody is capable of doing bad things. If we just have an authority figure to kind of let us out of that, right? We'll, and, but even within those very unethical, by the way, as the Vice Provost of Research, very unethical experiments, human subjects, um, there were people who declined to continue shocking the patients, who made that decision. They just said, no, I don't care that you're wearing a white lab coat and you have a clipboard. This, this is wrong. But most people went on. So these people interested me. And by studying the survivors of the Holocaust, I wanted to get a glimpse of, that, of those challenges in the worst thing I could imagine, which is a concentration camp. And so there's two authors here. Primo Levi was my starting point. I, I started with Primo Levi accidentally because he was a great, he was a chemist. So I'm a biochemist, he's a chemist. His book, The Periodic Table, spoke in a language that was familiar to me. Each chapter is named for an element, like potassium, and the chapter itself has the characteristics, I, you probably don't, maybe don't realize this, you're a chemist, that each element has characteristics. Right? It could be metallic, it could be salty, and each chapter was kind of like the element it was describing. So it was very scientific, right? And in that sense, it was comfortable for me. Right? I, 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 we have a common language, right? You know, the chemistry and physics on which we fed, besides being in themselves nourishments, vital in themselves, were the antidotes to fascism because they were clear and distinct and verifiable at every step, and not a tissue of lies and emptiness like the radio and newspapers. So that's one of the reasons I'm a scientist, is because I like verifiable things. And I'm uncomfortable in unverifiable things. I have opinions, but I'm comfortable in science. So Primo Levi was a great writer, and he, he wrote on this topic quite extensively. Another author that I greatly admire is not very well known in the West. I'm gonna get the name wrong, Tadush. Rochelle, am I saying it right? But close enough, Borowski. So Borowski is actually not Jewish. He is, um, he is, he was born in the Ukraine. At that time, that Ukraine was uh, part of Stalin's Russia. His father was sent to a gulag. His mother was sent, um, was sent to Siberia briefly, but eventually gets resettled into what is, what is now Poland. And he's kind of an accidental concentration camp victim. So he, his girlfriend, at the time, was very active in the Polish resistance. He wasn't. He was pretty apolitical, I would say. But one day, she doesn't show up, and he's waiting for her. So he says, well, I don't know where she is. She must be still at that house where she goes to meet people and do things, right? So he goes to find her, and of course, the Gestapo have staked the whole building out, and he walks right into it. And they arrest him, and they send him to Auschwitz for political resistance. So he ends up at Auschwitz. And he writes this amazing book, which again, because it was the behind the Iron Curtain, you don't hear much about it in the West. And I recommend this book to you hesitantly. Because if, you, if your view of the Holocaust is more um, not very deep, or you have a kind of a, a passing knowledge of the Holocaust, this is not the book to start with. This book will, if you're unprepared, will damage you. It's, it's hard to read. It's hard to read in ways I can't really explain. Because it's not like hard in the way that Schindler's List was a hard movie to watch, right? I think many of us have watched that movie and, or have experienced other movies about the Holocaust and thought this was horrible. But Borowski writes about is not just the horror that is visited upon the, the prisoners by the, the SS and the guards, but also the horror that is the society within the camps. Right? The way in which people, even within the camps, form a social structure, not surprisingly, but in that social structure, there are good, there are bad, and there's, but basically what it comes down to, and this is the part that's hard, is it's just survival. I just need to live to tomorrow, because tomorrow might be different than today. So people who, in this mind, like, they just have hope, and that's what sustains them, but it's a, it's a kind of horrible hope. And it's often at the expense of others. And that's what makes it difficult to read. He's able to get food. Because he's not, he's not a Jewish prisoner. He gets certain privileges because he's not. 
And so that's a, it's a very difficult to read. And if you read it and you're not affected by this book, you might be a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> so just fair warning, if you read this thing, well, I don't know what he was talking about, might, might, might want to think about that. So. But unfortunately, both of these authors end up committing suicide. So you would have potentially thought that the book was a catharsis and a way of dealing with it, but it did not give them peace, obviously. And so that's, that is a further tragedy that they suffered uh, much later. So we're going to sort of depart history now. Well, we're going to do a little more history, but then we're going to go towards, I think, a more optimistic because uh, you're probably thinking, man, Yusuf, you, you really need to get a job. <laughs> I, I read a lot of sad books. I, I just find them very, I find the human condition very interesting. But in part because I want to know how to do the right thing. That's what I want to know. I want to know if that moment comes, which am I? Am I the animal or am I the human? Which am I? You don't know until what happens. None of us do. So... The way in which I view my life has been, has been shaped by uh, two philosophers. I'm not a religious person, so I have philosophy. And the philosophers that actually have made the, made the greatest impact on me is a Roman senator by the name of Seneca and a, a Roman emperor by the, by the name of Marcus Aurelius. And both of these uh, gentlemen are Stoics. So for those of you who are it's not, you know, Stoicism gets kind of a bad name. It's like, oh, you don't have emotions. That's actually not what it's about. It's not like you're Mr. Spock, you don't have emotions. It's something completely different. Um, what it is is about this concept that the only good that matters is virtue. And that virtue itself is kind of divided up into these subcategories, wisdom, justice, courage, and moderation. If you get those things right, everything else is irrelevant. And so... You know, none of us can actually achieve these goals, right? It's like everything you aspire to be. You want to aspire to be great. You want to aspire to be moderate. You want to aspire to be just. You want to aspire to be courageous when it matters. And courage is, of course, doing the thing when you're terrified, right? Doing the thing just because you're some, you don't understand the nature of the risk is not courage. That's just blind stupidity, basically. But to understand how challenging this is and how difficult this is and what you might lose and continuing forward to do the right and just thing is what is a, the service that they're talking about. And so, you know, this is, and this, unfortunately, in the last few years, there's been a lot of what I call pop stoicism out in the literature. Like, you can actually find, like, YouTube videos and books, self help books, because, you know, some of it is, like, you know, can be sort of rattled down to a few pithy little statements. And I feel, I feel about that about the same way I feel about light beer. <laughs> not very good, and not like the original very much. Right? So, you know, I would warn you if you read these things, it, it, you have to read the, these books pretty frequently. Uh, Seneca was not able to translate, though, his, his views of, of kindness and wisdom and justice to his, uh, the student he was assigned as a, as a senator, which was Nero. So he, had, he writes several chapters where he's trying to counsel Nero to be a good person. We know that didn't work, right? <laughs> This is a, a relatively contemporary statue showing Seneca apparently trying to lecture at the not listening Nero. You can almost, you can almost see the adolescent anger here uh, of, of Nero. Likewise, Marcus Aurelius also had a disappointing, um, uh, I would say, interaction. His son uh, did not follow his teachings at all. Uh, his son was Commodus. Uh, from, if you watch the movie Gladiator, that's the emperor. Gladiator was a fictitious movie, but Commodus was a terrible terrible, terrible person, and certainly not a Stoic. So it's interesting to see these people, these great virtuous people, not able to translate it beyond themselves. And I think that's sort of a take-home message. Your philosophy and your beliefs are something internal to you. It's hard to sort of export them to other people. They have to come to those things themselves. And I read these gentlemen every week for sure, right? Especially when I'm not feeling great about things. Helps me understand. I, have a, I get angry easily. I just, and I don't have, that's the moderation part I don't really have. But it helps me to just think, okay, remember, when you get angry, that isn't really helping anything. And as my wife will tell you, it's not always helpful at home either. <laughs> so let's get to something which is a little bit more upbeat. The future. And so, I read a lot of science fiction. Not surprising, I'm a scientist, right? So a little kid, nerdy little kid, like science fiction, it's, you know, it's a tale as old as time, right? But these books and how I read them changed over the course of my life. 
The books you read when you're a young person and how you see yourself within the book changes dramatically as, you're, as you change, your, as your age goes up, basically. You read the books differently. You, in, you interact with the characters differently. And so it's a really different experience. So not surprising, since I grew up in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, I was very influenced by you know, Star Trek and the Apollo missions to the moon, which were, you know, you know, Houston was well known to me just from all the uh, Apollo uh, flights. And of course, the role of technology in society. And so, you know, they were very formative for me because it showed you a future. As a child of the Cold War, you weren't sure there was a future, right? If you remember, you were always kind of locked in this conversation about, well, 20 minutes from now, we may not be here. So it's good to think about a future, right? Because at that time, Cold War was, was palpably real. And I think everybody, judging by the age of most of the people in the room, I'm not telling them anything they don't already know. The other thing that's really interesting about science fiction, and, and, and sometimes in fiction in general, is you can talk about things that the rest of society does not really want to talk about yet. But you can do it in a safe way. So you can talk about racism, war, injustice in society, technology, because you're talking about aliens. This alien doesn't like that alien for the following reason. Well, we're not talking about race. We're talking about different species, so it's safe. We can have this conversation in a kind of safe way. We can discuss about alternative societies um, in, these, in these sort of protected forums. And a good example that was actually in the TV show, Star Trek, um, probably some of you might remember uh, Lieutenant Uhura, black character on the show, communications officer. First interracial kiss on television ever, Star Trek, between Uhura and Kirk. First, and that was crazy, the idea of, of a, of a kiss, of an interracial kiss, when people weren't even allowed to marry in most parts of the country, mind blowing. Having characters that were uh, Asian or black or of different ethnicities in important roles in the plot, also very groundbreaking. And so fiction acts as this really interesting way of having conversations that you actually can't have in public or polite society, not as easily at least. And you saw this also in the Soviet Union at this time, right? People like Alexander Solzhenitsyn were writing books like Cancer Report which was this, a great book that was really about communism, but the book was about the, the, the cancer war, right? But it was really about the, the, the cancer that was the Soviet society. And so he could write in this protected format uh, without being put into a gulag, although he was a gulag. It turns out the people who read the book also realized what it was about. <laughs> so the first book that I think in science fiction that had the, the biggest effect, and still is I think the book that had the greatest effect on me personally, was the book Dune which is a book which has been remade in the movies several times, here in the 80s and here more recently. It's good. This is actually a pretty good adaptation of the book, by the way, I think. Um, so but why do it resonate with me in particular? I was in high school when I read it, so that's always an interesting time to be reading anything. So this is when you're very, have a lot of things on your mind, just put it that way. And it's, for me, the book spoke directly to my own personal heritage as an Arab American. So the premise of the book, for those of you who have not read the book, is there's a planet called Arrakis. And on Arrakis is this a, a unique resource called spice that allows space travel. So Arrakis is the only planet with it, and all the other planets in the, in the galaxy take it from Arrakis to allow space flight. So Arrakis itself is a desert planet, almost no water, but there is a people that live there called the Fremen. The Fremen are, by any standard, basically Arab nomads. Okay, if you look at them, that's what they look like. And the outer, the, sort of the exploiting planets that need the spice uh, tend to be very much a European model, right? With aristocracies, uh, dukes. Duke Leto is Paul Atreides' dad. So he's, he's a, a prince, a European prince, who's come, to, who's come to Arrakis and falls in love with the people there, right? And Arrakis, you can throw like, spice is like my, my dad was from the Middle East, my mom was from Europe. So I was this, in Dune, I saw a lot of myself. I saw myself as both accepted but outcast. I'm neither Arab nor my European, right? But I'm, member, I'm in both. And Paul Atreides, the main character, the protagonist in his, this coming of age story, is living through this. He, he comes there as a European and he sort of embraces his you know, the planet, and he understands the culture, and he, and he changes. He goes to the classic coming-of-age uh, struggle to become, a, become a, a young man. And so 
I identified really deeply and strongly with this man and his struggles. This boy becomes man and his struggles. And I understand that I'm not on a desert planet, and I understand it, but as a, you know, as a 17 year old reading something, it really resonated with my own personal experiences of being not quite white, but you know, not quite Arab, but sort of in this, inter, in this intervening space, basically. It's a great book. It's considered one of the best science fictions of all time, uh, you know, depending on what kind of surveys you do. It's certainly in the top five. But really resonated with me very early on. Another book I thought was uh, a really good was a book called Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. What I liked about or Ender's Game, actually, is it's a really good book. The movie sucks. Don't, <laughs> don't watch the movie. Um, well, you can read, you, go to, you can watch the movie only after you read the book, right? Uh, but what this book really does, which is amazing, is it's written in 1985, or it actually comes out in 1985, so it was written before 1985, is it completely um, predicts social media. Because in this story, one of the biggest factors driving the political behavior of Earth at that time under this conflict are people who have kind of, uh, we would call them influencers today. So they are, they are essentially presences, video and you know, electronic presences that don't even exist. They're made up, right? Made up by people who are trying to manipulate the population into making different political decisions. And so despite the fact that the internet did not exist at this time, pretty much, and there was no such thing as Facebook, for sure, this book actually has the same social dynamics that we sort of see today, where influencers have this ridiculous effect on the behavior of major decisions in the world. I don't know where he got that idea. It was amazing. And the book is still very relevant. What's, I think, interesting about the particular story of the main protagonist, Ender Wiggin, and again, it's a coming-of-age story. Ender's a little boy at the beginning of the story. He grows up through the books and um, comes a, becomes an adult through the usual challenges and then... Uh, the triumph that comes through that is he goes one. The author goes one step further. Ender becomes a troubled character when he realizes how he became an adult. And it's a very Zen kind of book because he actually struggles with the decisions he made as an adolescent, right? And they were big decisions. I can't give you any spoilers. They're consequential decisions that had big effects. And so this story kind of goes beyond the usual arc of the coming of age, but then actually goes this next step, right? to what I would call more of a Zen or consciousness as a true realized person, a fully realized human being. And he regrets a lot of the things that he did to get there, which is interesting. Another book, not, this is not a happy book, um, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. I, you could argue it's not even science fiction, but it is in a post-apocalyptic world, so I'm gonna count it. This book is important to me, and remember this is supposed to be about my, the books that influenced me, is because this was the first book that I clearly knew I was identifying with different people in books. I identify with this gentleman. The book's great movie, again, not so good. Um, the father, who in this book is, is trying to save his son in this post-apocalyptic world. And about that same time I read this book, I was a new father, right? I have young kids. And I, for the first time, realized I was reading the book as the adult. I wasn't, I wasn't the kid, I wasn't the other character, I wasn't the heroic character, I was this man struggling to save his child. And that is why this book, right? it's a sad book in the sense, like it's, it's post-apocalyptic world in every sense of the world, a word, it's, it's, it's a hard read. Um, so again, a little bit of a warning there. Cormac McCarthy's a Texan, by the way, so I'm still writing, but this was my favorite of his books. Now, for a more recent author I like very much, uh, Adrian Tchaikovsky is a, a great um, young writer from the UK, and all his novels have these ridiculously interesting alien societies that are truly unique and not just contrivances of plot, right? These characters are fully developed societies. He understand he could have been a great scientist in my opinion because he really studies his, his life forms well and makes it a rich a surrounding around him. And the interactions of these characters are between humans and these species are really dynamic, and really interesting, and well written. And I, I can tell you how good a writer he is, is because in this book, Children of Time, the, there's humans in the book, but the other major species, which is the interaction with the book, is a civilization of spiders. Now, I do not like spiders. You, if a spider rolls up on the sky, I'm, I'm like, I, I'll either hit it or run, right? But I don't like spiders. Yet I read this entire book where they are the major characters. That's how interesting the book was. 
And so, you know, he actually is able to invent races and societies that I think are really textured and really interesting and very believable and also very alien. A lot of times, you know, you read science fiction, the difference between the humans and the aliens is a prosthetic stuck on their forehead or something like that. Or they have ears, they have like long ears, right? That's not that different, right? His are really, truly different, and you really have to understand them or you, you, you won't understand the book. So now let's get back to the point I made a few slides ago. The voice of new, new voices. And in science fiction, apologies to a few selected uh, great authors from the, uh, from the decades past, Science fiction has been mostly dominated by male writers over the, over the decades. But now we see this explosion of amazingly talented women writers. And so I wanted to, to I, I suspect many of them are not known to you, so I wanted to bring them to your attention. And so, but it comes back to my Cleopatra moment, right? Now we, now we can hear the voice. Now we can hear the voice, because those writers are writing great, great science fiction literature. So the first book I recommend to you is a book by Arcadia Martin called A Memory Called Empire. She's a, she's a, well, she's an academic, so maybe that's why I like her more. Um, she's a historian, and in her world, in this particular book, just imagine if the, how the world would have been different if the Aztecs had won everything. Not the Western Europeans, not the Chinese, the Aztecs. And it's a deeply uh, thoughtful book. A lot of politics, interesting politics. A lot of times when I read space opera, I'm like, really, do I really have to know the 37 names of the royal court of this or that? I can look it up later, right? No, you actually care what the politics are in her books. Because they actually make sense and they're actually relevant to the plot. They're not just there to sort of give you subplots that distract you. And so this is a great book. Uh, and I think the characters are just really um, well written and thoughtfully laid out. Another author I like very much is an author by the name of Anne Leckie. She actually studied in a workshop under Octavia Butler, another uh, one of the early uh, uh, science fiction writers, uh, you know, uh, and started, really she became more famous in the late 90s, early 2000s. And Anne, you know, her first book was this book, Ancillary Justice, where the, the main character is actually a sentient ship called The Justice of Torrin. And in the book, things happen, Justice of Torrin ends up being a character. And on essentially on a mission, to figure out why she was murdered, <laughs> right? And so, so the, the story is of, of this sort of like her trying to interact with human society being this AI ship, which has its own kind of challenges, just put it that way. Space opera, very high order, very complex world build, um, interesting politics. And for me, what was kind of interesting, uh, all the pronouns are female in this book. Now you think to yourself, well, why would that be weird? Except if you're a man reading books, you're used to having a very male perspective. But in these books, all, all the perspective is, everything's a pronoun, all the pronouns are female. And it's sort of like, you're like, it's hard to read it first. And then you get used to it, it's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And the characters are really interesting. And so she's a great author. Uh, my daughter's here, I actually like one of her other books more, but suffice to say, great authors write great books. Um, now, if, if heavy space drama with lots of politics and aliens uh, is, is not your thing, you want something that's a little bit more of a, a roller coaster ride, that I present to you Megan O'Keefe's books, uh, Velocity Weapon is one. Well. So she writes these kind of rollicking space fights, right? So she, she writes in the, what I call the classic science fiction mode, which is, you know, we're gonna have a lot of fighting, we're gonna have a lot of escaping, we're gonna have a lot of, you know, things happening, and it's just a roller coaster. But it's great fun. The books are well written and very clear. And, you know, uh, I read her, when she, I've read all of her stuff, so I can't I have to wait for some more stuff to come out. But I like reading her books when I just need to relax and chill and not read things like The Road or things about, you know, that are very serious. Lastly, the last book I have for you is a book that is, again, you can argue whether it's science fiction or not. It's called Life After Life by Kate Atkinson, a, a British author. And it, it's a very interesting construction of a novel because it poses this, the, the, the way the book sort of plays out is what would happen if you lived a life where you kept dying and then restarting? And it sounds kind of like a hokey kind of start, but it's an incredibly well-written book. Again, a little bit of a hard read, um, but I think I thought it was very strangely fulfilling. It actually a asks a lot of the questions, sort of existential questions about what makes a life meaningful. What are the decisions you make? What are the consequences of those decisions? Because the character of the book has a kind of fuzzy understanding of what has happened previously, but not a precise understanding. Right, so it's not like they can remember what happened you know, last, time I, last time I walked across the street, I got hit by a bus, let's not do that. It's not like that. 
It's more subtle than that, much more subtle than that. And so she's able to sort of go through her life and the things she experiences, I think, are opportunities to how you think about your life, your life, as you read her book and her travels. Because we have very similar things that happen to us in our course of our life. She has much worse things happen to her as well, but I consider that my own personal luck. But the prose is beautiful in this book, just fantastic, well-written. Um, you know, gosh, I always get to write like that. So it's nice to hear from a new uh, generation of writers that I think are, are just, just remarkable. And with that, I will leave you with um, that books have been my constant companion, right? I have been reading books since apparently I named my cat Napoleon. Um, <laughs> so they, I read every night for relaxation and during the day for knowledge. Uh, they both have their merits, I suppose. Uh, and of course, I must say also, books have been my constant companion for my whole life. My family, my wife Lisa, who's here tonight, we've been uh, on this road together for 35 years. So that's a, the, you know, I'm still reading books, and I think this has been, I have, it's nice to have a companion on the road with you, right? And of course, my, my daughter, Raven, who's here tonight, Devin, she's doing her homework, so she couldn't be here tonight, but also nice to have other travelers with you on this, on this road. So with that, I'm happy to, I don't know how this works, take questions or do whatever, we'll go drink wine or whatever we're supposed to do. I think we can take some How about, sure. uh, about five minutes of questions, Max? Sure. Anybody? How do you find your books? What's that? How do you find the books that you read? Oh, you know, it gets harder and harder, it seems, every year. I mean, I, I go to Amazon, I find books that write like this other book, and I, I read, uh, I'll try to find um, things that are, once I discover a writer that I like, I tend to read all of that writer's books. I think that's the, for me, I, it's like you find the, the vein of gold, and you're just going to keep mining it until the gold isn't there anymore. So I think for me, when I find a writer, I stick with them, and I'll wait for their new books. Well, actually, Mark, um, Adrian Tchaikovsky had a book come out yesterday, or two days ago, which I, I'm now reading. So, uh, you know, now I'm like waiting on the authors, like, write faster. Um, on the historical stuff, I think, I think I, I read history because I find it important to understand how to make decisions. I'm very interested in making the right decision in life. And there's a lot of things we can't control. Fates are always there. Right? You can wear your seatbelt and still get a car accident, right? But I feel, I feel like if I'm prepared, then I will decrease the probability that something bad will happen to me. I'll increase the probability that I'll make the right decision when the time comes. And I live in fear of that moment, by the way. Mm -hmm. Then when that moment comes, will I make the right decisions? In the laboratory, it's pretty straightforward, but in the life, it's a lot harder. Yeah. yeah. First, uh, Thank you for your contribution to science, Professor, and to the students as a great educator. And this has been truly a wonderful um, lecture. Um, I have a, a book addiction. I'm, I'm, I'm paying $400 a month just to store some of my books <laughs> at storage. Um, but it's a wonderful uh, position to be in. Um, my question to you, sir, is do you have a system by which you read the book? I, when I started my 50-year book plan years ago that I haven't fulfilled, obviously, um, I had this strange uh, problem where I needed to read every word in the book. But then I discovered the OPEER system, overview, Preview, interview, review. And my question to you, sir, is do you need to read from the beginning to the end all of your books, or do you scan the book and choose chapters? How do you how do you consume this vast quantity of reading material? I I, I scan, so I will admit I, I cheat, right? I, I don't read well, every let's single say cheat. Let's uncut. Let's say yeah. Yeah. what's your system? Right. My system is I, I read quickly, and this hurts you on the space opera, by the way, because there are so many subplots that sometimes it's easy to sort of not keep up on all of them. So, but I, because I read so much, I tend to read quickly through skimming, and then I sometimes go back and you know reinforce something that I thought was really interesting. So sometimes I find a passage particularly interesting, and then I'll read that paragraph, for instance, or that, that chapter very carefully. 
Uh, so it comes and goes a little bit. Do you an annotate? And, and also, in, obviously, there was a point where I really needed the tactile, the, the sensory feeling of the smell of books, and that's one of the reasons I have all these books. But now we've moved into this whole digital phenomenon, so I'm trying to learn how to use those, like Kindle and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I read a lot of things on Kindle now, but nothing replaces the sort of sensory pleasure of holding a book and reading a book. It's the smell, the paper, you know, the way it feels in your hands. It, it, Kindles do not have that. And so, I, and I, I was talking about in the libraries, you know, I used to love being in libraries. The smell of the books, yes. the randomness of the book. You'd be looking for a book, and you come across this other book, and you'd yes. suddenly be reading that book. Yes. Not reading, and not doing your assignment for the class. Yes. Right? <laughs> and so I, I think, you know, I don't really have a system so much as a passion. And therefore, in that sense, I'm happy with it. Um, and I think it's served me reasonably well. So, it's in, so your system is, in, you intuit when you open, you, you, you intuit, and, and that's that's your system. You have this feeling of, I, of where you want to go, and let that, that, that. Yeah, I think I think I do. I think I know what I'm looking for generally in a book, and I think it's hard for me to put. It, I, I, sometimes I'll just finish the book because it's I'm, I've started. I will be kind of dogmatic sometimes, but I do. I don't. I don't annotate fiction books, but I will say that like those philosophy books are are, are quite marked up. Quite marked up, which I know offends some folks if you dog ear and mark books up. But it's my book, I bought it, I can dog ear and mark it up. Damn it. So, anyway. All right. Um, I, I'd like to say, um, I'd like, I thought this was just wonderful, by the way. Right. It was great. Um, and I think you will all join me in round of applause. glasses on because what's happened is I lost my other pair of glasses so I may actually resort to reading some of this but anyhow I'm Nancy Shelby and I'm a current board member of the Friends of Modern Library um, and I'm a retired banker which is great because I have more time to read. Um, over 25 years ago my husband and I attended um, started attending rice baseball games and that's what sucked us into the world of rice um, and um, it, 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 it was a great entry point, and we've gone beyond sports, and um, so I'm in the library, that's a great passion for me. And I was very lucky because growing up, I had parents who really supported and loved libraries. And indeed, my dad, um, we lived in a small village um, in a suburban New York, and he was the founding trustee of the library. He felt so strongly that we've got to have a library, we're going to have a successful town. Um, tonight's lecture was presented by the Friends of Bonkin Library, and the Friends of, is a membership organization. I know that some of you are members, and I hope that someday all of you will be members. Um, and what we do is we provide financial support uh, to Rice University's Fondren Library, and we present lectures tonight and events for our members and for the greater Houston community. And if you aren't already a member, I would really ask you personally to seriously think about joining. Uh, to me, the heart of a university is its library, and all great universities have great libraries. As libraries adapt to new forms, materials, storage needs, and users, the Friends help to meet those needs. We want Rice University, Fondren Library, and the community we serve to remain in the top echelon of academia and research. So again, I hope that you will consider joining us um, and the nice thing about being a member is we'll give you advance notice in the email of um, events like this. So thank you all for attending tonight, and I'd like to present a small thank you gift. Oh, or big thank thank you. Gift. And you know, I think you're gonna have a lot of need for this tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I, I always I always love umbrellas because I always lose them and leave them around the house. I need them, they're never when I have and they're never there when I need them, let's put it that way. Yeah, that's great. Well thank you and I hope thank you, you join us at our session.